morning, Borodá. Um, can I start by disappointing everyone? Uh, those of you who are expecting me to say what I'm going to recommend in relation to Estin are going to be disappointed because uh, from my point of view, this is part of the process of deciding where inspection sits within the broader arrangements for uh, accountability and improvement. So genuinely, in the course of the, the two days, the kind of, of uh, discussions we have, the kind of, of uh, comments that you make, um, I'll be listening very carefully because I'll be wanting to, to build them into to, um, what ultimately we'll be recommending about inspection, where that sits within this broader accountability, the kind of things that, that Steve was, uh, was talking about. Um, and that makes, I think, from my point of view, and I think more generally, this is a very, very important conference because um, Wales is, is, is in the middle of something um, which has the potential, I think, to be really, very radical and very important. Uh, but if we don't get the accountability bit right, uh, then the likelihood is that what we'll have is a system that's fighting with itself, that is trying to go in one direction but is being pulled in another direction. So getting this whole area of accountability and, and the role of inspection within that right is incredibly important. Um, and this audience in particular, I'm acutely aware, uh, has a particularly difficult task in looking at uh, the aspirations which are embedded in the uh, in curriculum for Wales and the purposes that uh, we're trying to pursue for our young people. Um, uh, but you have very particular pressures on you, um, not least in terms of the examination and qualification system. And that's not simply because um, you may have performance measures about how well is a school doing in relation to those, but of course your responsibility is to the young people that you have and they should do as well as possible uh, in those qualifications. So quite naturally, the people in this room uh, will have to be convinced that the relationship between accountability, the relationship which that has to qualifications and the relationship that has to your responsibilities to those young people in terms of those qualifications, that that all comes together in a way that is actually going to be uh, in the best interests of those uh, young people. So um, what, I, what I hope that will come out of the two days is something which is very forward-looking. We're not, we're not going to analyse or, or pour over uh, the inadequacies of, of perceived inadequacies of what's happening at the moment, but very much try to imagine what's possible um, and the, the point that Steve was making, I think, is very important, Steve Mumby was making, is very important, uh, is that you, at the end of the day, need to feel confident that you believe that this whole agenda is coming together in a way that's going to be the best interest of your children. Uh, and the, the whole approach that's being taken in Wales, the, the, the so-called co-construction, um, has to be more than lip service. It has to be a, a, a process which allows you to shape and therefore to own and have confidence in whatever comes out at the other uh, uh, end of the, of, the, of the process. When we think about accountability uh, and think about the nature of the accountability which we currently have um, uh, across the UK, and actually the UK is relatively unusual internationally in terms of its approach to accountability. It's not something which is, is uh, characteristic of, of, uh, country, of European countries and, and, uh, and beyond. And even in UK terms, um, we're really only talking about a kind of view of accountability which date, dates back to um, the mid-1970s, point at which um, politicians in the UK lost faith in the teaching profession. Uh, the, the, the famous Jim Callaghan made a, a speech in Ruskin College in 1976 where essentially what he said is, um, we don't think and representing the public, we don't think the schools are actually serving our children as well as they should do, and we as politicians are going to get much more involved in, in, in shaping the experience that our young people have and make our, articulate our expectations about what schools will do in a much more explicit way than has been the case hitherto. And from that speech by a Labour Prime Minister in 1976, followed shortly afterwards um, by Margaret Thatcher and the, the Conservative government in the, in the 1980s and into the 1990s, um, uh, that then gave rise to uh, a, an approach to accountability that was increasingly reflecting that lack of faith in the teaching profession, that lack of faith that left to its own devices, teachers will do a good job by their children. That's why we are where we are today, uh, because 
it, it traces back to that point. And, uh, the first inspection reports were published in 1983. Prior to 1983, inspection was largely about policy and advice. It wasn't about school accountability, certainly not individual school accountability. It was largely a, a process that was designed to inform uh, the political and policy debate and to provide advice to schools of a more general nature. But from 1983 onwards, increasingly, and in 1992 with the creation of, of uh, Ofsted at Eston, the, the nature of inspection then became very different from the way it had been uh, hitherto. So when we're thinking about uh, what a new accountability uh, an inspection um, regime might look like, we've got to recognise that simply saying there was a golden age, you know, back prior to the 1970s, which we just need to return to, is not an option, because that is going to, re the, the danger is that recreates the kind of confidence issues which were around then. So what we need to do as a, as a, as a profession uh, is to convince politicians and the public more generally um, that we will shape an accountability system which can give them confidence that the, 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 the young people of Wales are being well served and the young people of Wales are going to achieve uh, in relation to the four purposes of the national curriculum as well as we collectively can possibly um, uh, help them to do so. The problem is, for all of us, is that we are in a situation where the challenge facing education, if you look across the world, this is the case, the challenge facing education has never been more difficult. Knowing what the right thing to do, the right thing to do for our children, it's never been more difficult. What I talked about in terms of the growth of accountability mechanisms took place in the context of an increasing acceptance, uh, particularly from, from 1988 onwards with the creation of the national curriculum, that we know what the curriculum should look like. We know what schools are for. Schools are for delivering the curriculum that was created in 1988, and therefore we need an accountability system that makes sure that that uh, is what is actually happening in our schools, and you, and you, you, you uh, create the structures round about that that try to make sure that's, uh, that's going to happen. The problem now is that the nature of uh, the world that our young people, uh, are, that we are all living in, and our young people will live their lives in as they move into adulthood and, and uh, right throughout the entirety of this century and beyond, uh, we can't even begin to anticipate the nature of that world. Um, they will, and therefore, what we need to do during the short time we have them that will help equip them, uh, not just to cope, but to thrive in that world that they're um, uh, going to be living their entire uh, life in. So across the world, um, there's an increasing debate about the nature of the curriculum. Universities gave up curriculum studies for about 15 years. It's quite hard to find anyone inside a university who actually specialises in the curriculum, because from 1988 onwards, that wasn't an issue. Um, but it is now. It really is now. What is it that we can best do in order to ensure that our young people are uh, uh, getting the kind of experience during their time at school which is going to help them to thrive as they move forward throughout their lives? Um, and it's interesting that the nature of the way in which that worldwide debate is going, there, there are patterns emerging um, which suggests that the kind of things that we're doing here in Wales puts Wales right in the vanguard of current thinking about the, the best way in which we can serve our young people in the future. Uh, if you look at some of the, 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 the work the OECD has been doing recently on the 2030 project and the, some of the uh, contributions that Andreas Slyke was making, including what Andreas uh, said to, to, has said to us, um, the thrust of what's being said is very much along the lines of the kind of things that are happening here in Wales at the moment. That's about these four purposes. I'm not going to go into the four purposes that, that, that they're there, but it's about saying uh, that we should think about the curriculum as not just about uh, coverage of content or, or skills, but about all of that, how all of that comes together to help to shape young people so that they can move forward uh, in their lives uh, in relation to the kind of, of way in which we've helped them to be ready to engage with that uh, uh, future. And it's, it, the way in which we go about that, uh, first of all, means that we need to be very clear what we're talking about. Um, and that's all young people in relation to those purpose, purposes. It's breaking the link between identity and destiny. It's breaking the link between where you come from determines where you're going to end up. 
That's a critical part of our mission as, as educators. It's about raising standards, but it's about defining standards in a way that is not simply a narrow definition of what standards are. It means that the young people are getting the best learning possible uh, and that they themselves are developing in relation to that learning. Their own learning is developing to the highest uh, standard that they can arise. So we need a debate about standards so that standards don't become reductionist and therefore drive uh, um, behaviours which are also reductionist. We need to get that progressive line of sight, so the relatively short time that we have young people in school, looking from when they, when they enter, uh, uh, at three, four or five, whenever they come into the, the broad education system to the point at which they leave, we've got a clear line of sight in terms of progression, in terms of their learning, in relation to those four purposes. Um, we need to ensure that young people, that, that their experience of school gives them an intrinsic satisfaction in learning. An intrinsic satisfaction in learning. That learning gives you a buzz, learning is worthwhile, learning is something you can enjoy. Learning is not simply something you do in order to pass a test or pass an exam. Uh, and that's a critical part of what we need to do. If young people are going to be uh, successful lifelong learners, then they have got to get that intrinsic satisfaction, that belief in learning and satisfaction from engaging in learning, not simply as a means to an end in terms of a particular uh, test. And as one of the questions earlier um, was there, we've got to be very clear about well-being, uh, that young people will, uh, will learn well and they will thrive throughout their lives if we engage with that whole notion of their well-being while they're at school and helping, them, helping equip them to understand how they can look after themselves in terms of their own well-being as they move forward into the next stages in their life. And to do that, there's a whole variety of things that we need to do, and that's um, Steve's point about an ecosystem is, is absolutely at the heart of what Wales is, is, is engaged in at the moment. Uh, it's not just simply picking a bit of reform and saying, we'll do that and the rest will have to just fit in. It's genuinely looking at the, at the, the whole nature of, of the education uh, system as an ecosystem where all the parts interact and you change one bit and it affects something else. You've got to be able to think about that. Um, so we've got to focus on what matters. Uh, We've got to reconcile, and this is something that's come through, we've got to recognise what matters, what works and what's possible. And if there's one justification for co-construction, that's it. Because you're in the best position to reconcile what matters, what works and what's possible. Uh, it's not simply a matter of what's possible. Uh, we've got to be very clear about our ambition, about what matters. We've got to draw on experience from elsewhere in terms of what... I, I, actually, I'm not allowed to hear in the phrase what works. It's what might work. Uh, it, there isn't any absolute thing you can just lift from somewhere else and that'll work. It's a process of learning about uh, how, 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 how things have been addressed and the way in which they, they can help us to understand how we can best engage with, with young people. Um, that whole notion of enthusiastic engagement... Uh, the word capacity has been used a lot in the course this morning. It is absolutely uh, 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 critical. The confidence and capacity of those who are engaging with our uh, uh, young people. Um, using evidence in ways that, that uh, 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 support and challenge uh, our assumptions. Cozy assumptions. I mean, actually, partly that's what was, was, was the, the, what, what happened back in the 1970s when politicians lost faith in us, because they thought we all shared, there was a kind of professional conspiracy, they even used the phrase professional conspiracy, uh, that was designed to keep the public out. They talked about the secret garden, secret garden of the curriculum, something which is, not, which is all about professionals, everybody else uh, keep out. A, there was an education minister back in the 1960s whose name I think was Tomlinson, who proudly said, he was, he was from Yorkshire, so forgive the, forgive the North Country attempt at an accent, Minister knows nought about curriculum. Proudly said that, Minister knows nought about curriculum, not my job, that's your job, that's a professional's job. And then they began to say, well actually, this is not enough, we're all engaged in thinking about the nature of the, of the curriculum. So what does that mean uh, in terms of uh, assessment, accountability and uh, inspection. What does it mean in terms of what we should look for in terms of the kind of, of, of approach to this area which is going to um, uh, work with all that we're trying to do, not work against, not sit in judgment on, but actually help us uh, as part of the process of doing the kind of things that, that we believe are the right things to do. Um, the first one is we've got to get a, an approach whereby the information we get from uh, uh, accountability, the evidence that we're getting uh, from that, um, is timely. It's, it's not telling us what was the case. It's giving us information that allows us, helps us, 
to engage with, with the looking forward into the future. So there's something about accountability systems that are often backward looking. They tell you what was the case in the past and therefore you've got a leap of faith that because it was like that, it's like that now and therefore it's going to be like that in the future. So there's, there's an issue about the timeliness, the immediacy of, of uh, uh, the evidence we get from um, uh, accountability. And I think we need to reframe the debate. We need to reframe the language that we use around accountability. I prefer us to use the language of learning uh, rather than the language of judgment. So the, what the accountability system is about is helping us all to learn better uh, how to improve, enhance the learning of our young people. So the accountability system is about learning. Uh, it's not about simply about judging or putting a label on whatever it is that's, uh, that's, uh, that's happening. It's got to focus on what really matters. Uh, and in, in our context, that's about the whole, the four curriculum purposes and the way in which that's actually taking shape and being given life in, in, uh, in our schools. Um, the accountability system has got to um, not be something that is alien, uh, not a done to process, but a done with process. One that, that, that genuinely uh, uh, empowers uh, uh, the young people themselves, but also those, the, the teacher schools and the system more generally. Um, to pursue the best routes towards those curriculum purposes. Uh, it's somebody on the outside um, doesn't have the right answer, which you've just got to try and arrive at somehow or other in order to satisfy that accountability mechanism. The right answer is the answer that we collectively uh, arrive at. I think that was a, that was a theme that uh, Steve Mumby was, uh, was talking about. Uh, we've got to get the consistency right uh, so that uh, uh, the, the, the alignment between all the various external uh, pressure there are on a school, whether that comes from uh, consortia, whether that comes from Welsh Government, whether that comes from Eston, uh, that there's a consistency and alignment across all of those. So schools are not trying to work out at any particular point in time which master they're trying to serve, who they're trying to please in order to satisfy uh, accountability. But of course, of course, accountability has also got to give assurance. Uh, it's got to give assurance. The whole question of public confidence the public has to have confidence that, we, uh, that they, can, they can safely leave their children in our charge and left in our charge, their children will do well, be well looked after, we'll be conscious of their well-being, but we'll also build them in relation to the kind of purposes that we're talking about. So they need assurance that that's actually happening at the individual level, at the school level, at the, at the, at the, the uh, authority and consortium level, and also at the, at the level of the um, system as a whole. Uh, and there are a number of uh, issues which I just want to pick out, uh, which uh, I think, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thinking about these in the context of, of, of the uh, work I'm doing now around uh, Eston, um, there's a number of things that we've got to think about in terms of what, how do we avoid some of the perverse effects that have been around in the past, uh, not, not necessarily, uh, in, particularly in Wales, but are, are generally a function of, of, of uh, high stakes accountability systems. Uh, and the first one is something which, um, relates back to, to work that was, was done back in the, in the uh, 1970s by Donald Campbell. Um, and essentially, what that says is that, um, if, I, if I simplify it, that if you have a single, if you reduce accountability to a number, if you reduce it to one judgment, um, then the, the consequences of that are that A, people will, will try to, to arrive at that number, or, or, or judgment or label, and sometimes that means they'll do things that you don't want them to do. Um, it also, the tendency is for the measure itself to become inflated. People find ways of making it look better than it actually is. So, so it's not helping learning, it's actually doing the reverse, because it's masking the kind of things that really need to happen to make things better in order to look better. Uh, not to be better, and that's, that's one of the can be one of the consequences if you have an oversimplistic reduction of the, of the process. Um, all of that means that the scores, whatever they are at the end of the day, lose their value. So you may, you may be able to produce you know, uh, spreadsheets till the cows come home, but actually they're all based on, on uh, data which is corrupted from the start, and therefore it looks as if things are happening, but actually you're getting the worst of all possible worlds. That the, the, the corrupted data, the data is not helping learning inside the school, nor is it giving an accurate picture of what's happening more generally inside, uh, inside the system as a, as a whole. And the whole education process becomes uh, uh, distorted. Um, and any of, any of those, those if, we, if we try to reduce um, the complexity of what you are all engaged in to something which is, is, to lends itself to uh, a very simple uh, overarching 
judgment, whether that be in a league table or anything else, then the, li the likelihood is uh, that we're going to get those consequences. And the likelihood hood is that you drive uh, the kind of culture in the system um, where children serve the schools rather than the schools serving the children. Uh, so that's where you get the business of gaming, that's where you get focus on the marginal youngsters in order that they move up and down and ignore the ones that you don't think you can make enough progress on to look good. In the All of that happens. So you end up with a system where children serve the schools rather than schools serving the children. Uh, another thing that we need to address in terms of the accountability structure, and which is, is, was, was one of the messages very much in, in uh, uh, successful futures, was about the nature of assessment. I'm not going to go through uh, all of that, but essentially um, the message I think that Steve Davis gave uh, in, the, in the opening, his opening remarks, that we must be very clear that if there's a tension between assessment helping children's learning and assessment being used for accountability, then helping children's learning wins every time. And if there is a consequence, uh, if, the, if the distorting effect of it being used for accountability inhibits the extent to which it's going to improve children's learning, then we have to find different ways of getting the accountability evidence that we need and not focus, not allow children's learning to become um, distorted. So uh, we have to be careful that assessment doesn't, uh, isn't used in order to serve conflicting purposes that I've just been talking about. Um, make sure assessment doesn't rely uh, simply on that which you can measure as a sole indicator. Um, uh, uh, the things that are most easily measured become the things that matter, matter most. And, and that's true in terms of children's learning because a lot, of what, a lot of what children learn is actually very hard to assess. It's extremely difficult to assess. Um, uh, so that we've got to recognise that, that and we've got to do justice to that complexity in terms of the assessment processes we have, not say because it's so difficult we'll just use this because that's what we've got. Uh, we've got to be really invest and when we talk about capacity building, one of the most important areas for capacity building is in the profession's capacity to assess the things that matter and not the things that, are most, that you, you gravitate towards in terms of, of, of what, what you can do in order to arrive at what, what appears to be an assessment at the, at the end of the day. A, second, a third thing that we've got to be careful about is what I have described as the improvement trap. Um, so, ironically, I worry about improvement. I worry about the word improvement. Um, because what, we, what you often get is that the nature of all the pressures, all the pressures that surround a school or an education system, uh, often drive us into a kind of vortex where what we end up with is um, improvement, which is in relation to uh, a metrics-driven reductionist view of what education is for. And all of those pressures are all on all of us, and they do drive you in that direction. They do push you into that, into that vortex where what matters disappears into the vortex uh, because of, the, of, of those external pressures. And we know the kind of things that will, are liable to make things better. We know that if you invest in teacher capacity, we know that if you, uh, you, you get better evidence about um, uh, uh, what works and the nature of the, of, the, of the surround to good learning and teaching, we know that if you invest in leadership, we know if we encourage greater collaboration, all of that will help. But if we're not clear about what it's for in the first place, what we end up with is better metrics-driven reductionist curriculum. That all we do is get better and better at doing things that are less and less relevant. So that the whole system of accountability and, and, and uh, uh, inspection has got to be very clear that what we are engaging with doesn't drive us into that improvement trap. We were satisfied with improvement, but improvement is not necessarily the things that matter most. A further, um, uh, 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 well, in terms of avoiding the improvement, the, the, the improvement trap, got to reflect the changes in the purposes, maintain the focus of those purposes as the driver of learning and teaching, be clear about what matters, and of course, professional learning and leadership at the heart of that. And interestingly, the Swedish, uh, the Finnish education minister um, last year said some very important things, I think, uh, which broadly reflects the kind of things that I've been saying about. But perhaps the most important one is the phrase, teachers are the change makers. Teachers are the change makers. That the nature of what actually happens at the end of the day, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? You know, it's, it's you know as, as heads, that actually your ability to, to, to influence what children uh, learn at the end of the day and the quality of their learning is all about the teachers you've got. That's, that's at the end of the day where, the, where you make the biggest difference. So uh, investing in teachers, are, but recognising that we are working in a context where 
the nature of what it is, that how we define good learning and teaching and how we define the purposes of learning is not the same as it was in the past. It's, that itself is changing and we, we must not be afraid to engage with that. So the, the kind of, of, of uh, understandable um, uh, refrain that you sometimes hear from teachers and from head teachers, oh for goodness sake, uh, can't they just stop this change process? Just leave us alone and let us just do what we do and we'll, we, we can do that well. That's very understandable, but it's not good enough because the context that we operate within means that you, the profession, has got to take control, much greater control, of making sure that we're doing the right things, not just being left to do the things that we've done uh, uh, better and, and better. We've got to be careful about what I'm calling simplistic simplicity, uh, um, and that's about overemphasizing reliability, uh, because one of the ways in which you arrive at highly reliable accountability mechanisms is to reduce what you look at to something that's easily measurable. So you just reduce it all and you get something which is nice and simple but it actually ends a day as being simplistic. It doesn't do justice to the breadth of the curriculum purposes. So we need to create a narrative that goes beyond numbers. It doesn't, data matters. Uh, but data matters as part of helping us to arrive at, at, at a view. Data is part of an evidence base. It isn't the evidence base. Uh, and we need to place greater value on judgment at the end of the day, uh, not simply on the numbers. The numbers don't give you the answers. The numbers give you the questions most of the time in terms of, of uh, uh, how we're actually performing. And I think we've got to be awfully careful that we don't patronise um, the profession, but particularly patronise parents. Because... Uh, you know, again, a refrain that comes through is, oh, this is all very well, all this stuff's all very well, but at the end of the day, parents will never understand it all day if we've just got to give them something nice and simple. Uh, so we've got to, in inspection terms, you've got to tell them a school is excellent or a school is, is in special measure. That's all they need to know. Um, uh, or a school is red or a school is green. That's all they need to know. Uh, actually, uh, I think that's profoundly patronising of, of parents. I think we need to get better at understanding how we communicate with all of those who have an interest in education in ways that do justice to complexity and we don't end up uh, 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 patronising um, those um, uh, for whom it matters, really matters at the end of the day. Uh, and then there's, there's, there's this legacy lag, which I talked about earlier. So we need something that's as close to real time as possible. Um, which, which recognises that things actually may be changing and get better so that the evaluation that you've got uh, doesn't relate to something that was true or may have been true but isn't necessarily uh, true at the moment. Therefore, we need an accountability system that helps us to look forward, that is proactive uh, and that's it's an engine, a driver of making things better than a way of helping us to reflect and sometimes despair about uh, uh, where we were. And part of that, um, and this is the last of them, is about... Um, the whole business of a system uh, uh, which, uh, not just Wales, I mean this is generally to do with high stakes accountability, where compliance um, becomes um, the norm. We're trying to work out what it is that's expected of you and then just trying to do your best to satisfy whatever it is that comes on the outside. So, so we take agency, we take the capacity to, to actually do the sort of things that are going to make the biggest difference uh, out of the system uh, and, we, and we simply end up uh, asking uh, head teachers or rewarding head teachers for being most compliant. So the head teachers who do very well are, can be the most compliant head teachers inside the system under the current, uh, the current arrangements. So we need a bit more humility in the accountability system. We need to understand that actually there are no simple answers and nobody has the answer in that sense. So we need that evidence that aids learning, but within that we need some humility uh, in the system that recognises the complexity of the job that you're doing on a day and daily basis uh, without at the same time just saying anything, uh, anything goes. Uh, but the more you take ownership of quality, the more immediate will be the improvement. The more immediate will be the things that actually get better at the end of the day. The less ownership you have, uh, the more it's going to, the, the lag effect is going to be there uh, 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 overall. And then I think in this, this afternoon's discussion about self-evaluation seems to me to be incredibly important. Um, uh, I was very much involved in uh, uh, Scotland's development of self-evaluation back in the, uh, in the 1990s, where Scotland produced uh, a set of indicators called how good is our school, 
translated into Lord knows how many languages. I wish I'd had some kind of uh, uh, copyright rights on that because I'd be a very rich man if I did. Uh, and it's, it, it crops up in all sorts of places across the world. How good is our school? You'll find it in all sorts of places uh, across the world. And it's a, it's, a good, it's a good set of quality indicators that, it, that embed uh, our understanding at that time about the sort of things that, that were important in terms of, of high quality learning. But the problem with self-evaluation is that it can become an end in itself. If self-evaluation is about proving that you're doing something rather than learning what you need to do, then it simply becomes a process that we engage in, which is part of this process of looking good rather than being good. So when we're thinking about self-evaluation, the context of the schools of learning organisation or the learning consortium or the learning education system, we've got to be very clear that self-evaluation doesn't end up as something which is about proving how good we are rather than helping us to learn how to get better. Uh, and that, that's, that's deeply cultural in terms of, of, uh, of what that actually means at the end of the day. So, what does all that add up to? Underlying messages. Uh, the, the assessment, accountability and improvement framework has got to be true to the purposes of the curriculum, got to be true to what it is that we're setting out to do in the first, what we believe matters at the end of the day. Um, it has to enhance the quality for all young people. And when we talk about standards, we must be sure those standards don't become reduced to the measurable, uh, that the standards reflect what matters. So we're talking about standards, but we need to, to engage in a standards agenda that makes it clear what it is that we're talking about in terms of the breadth uh, of, of uh, experience that young people get. Uh, when we talk about closing the gap, um, we, and we tend to talk about closing the attainment gap, uh, the experiential gap is at least as big as the attainment gap. Uh, so what's in those four purposes? Many young people will get some of that because of the background they have. Many young people will you know, be at the starting gate in relation to those purposes and taken forward because of the way in which their, their family background helps them to do so. Um, the schools are, are, for many young people, are the only place where that experiential gap will be bridged. The only place where we'll be able to take young people forward who, whose, whose circumstances, whose identity is actually going to shape their, uh, shape their future. So that whole business about, about, about uh, standards is... is uh, is critical. We must be careful that an accountability system doesn't disempower. Uh, accountability system, that it, it is a done with, you feel part of it, you own it, you see the point of it. Sometimes it may come up with uncomfortable conclusions, but nonetheless, it's, it's uncomfortable conclusions that you recognise that if they are uncomfortable, they probably should be uncomfortable, because, because you have engaged in the process by which we, um, we arrive at that. Um, we need uh, an assessment process to use the kind of, of, of uh, uh, shorthand uh, that enables, doesn't label. Uh, and that's, that's assessment for learning. But of course, what we need is accountability for learning too. Accountability that enables, doesn't just simply uh, label. We need to value qualitative judgments. We need to value the professional judgment of teachers. Um, it, so it's not simply those things that come out of the uh, measurable process that actually uh, are the things that, that should be given greatest weight. Uh, that the qualitative judgment, the nature of the way in which teachers are evaluating and engaging and assessing young people's learning, we need to place uh, greater uh, uh, value by professionals and also of the learning. Um, and we need to have that pervading the entire educational and wider political community. This whole process, when we're thinking about accountability, has got to be something which is not only owned by the profession, but is actually owned by the, the broader community in Wales, and particularly the political community in Wales. Go back to that business of public confidence. If coming out of this process, there's a belief uh, that this is that all, all we have done is take, you know, a bit like Jenga, you know, we've pulled things out of the thing and then the whole, the whole lot uh, falls down. All we're doing is taking things out. Um, then, we'll, then we'll, we'll have no confidence that actually what we're doing. What we need to do, what you need to do, what the profession needs to do is to persuade the politicians, persuade the community more generally that the kind of accountability we're talking about will actually lead to better learning for the young people. It will give them the kind of information uh, they need, the right information, but about better learning uh, for young people. And all of that means it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable because we need to be willing to examine established beliefs and habits. One of the things that's been said to me many times over the course of, of uh, the curriculum um, uh, review is that we have a teaching profession that has been conditioned to comply and deliver. Uh, 
Uh, and part of the challenge, the leadership challenge in Wales just now, and that's both for leaders themselves, in terms of their own beliefs and habits, but also for how they communicate that to their staff, that those beliefs and habits, which are about compliance and delivery, we've got to challenge those beliefs and give people the confidence and the capacity to engage with the kind of agenda we're talking about. That's particularly difficult in secondary schools, and I know that, but that's not a reason for not doing it. Thank you very much.